I have shared with some of you before that, that parents have a way of torturing children. Mine did. It was one particular year, uh, just about this time of year, uh, because it was long before Christmas would arrive, um, but, but my family would put the tree up and all the decorations sometime just after Thanksgiving, and I mean just after Thanksgiving. And my mom had, had this habit of, of wrapping at least one gift for all of us when the presents went under the tree. And so from the first part of December, I had a squishy present. And she would occasionally give me hints or, or threats. One of the particular threats was if you open this present or if you peek at this present before Christmas, I will give it to your best friend. <laughs> oh, the temptation, but there was no way I was going to do that because Billy Ashlock was not going to get my gift. But it was squishy, and, and, and there would occasionally be, be clues as to what it was. And, and so occasionally my mom, over the next week or two, would drop a hint to me or my sister as to what was in the gift. And, and it was almost useless clues, but it was still a clue. And somehow, some way, I think if we go back to Old Testament prophecy, we would almost see it like that squishy present under the tree. God's given hints as to what's to come, but until you actually see it, there is no way you're going to figure this out. There's, it, it just, it'll make sense once you see it, but until you see it, I give you all the hints that you want, and, and it's not going to make sense. That's where we are with Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, and I want to encourage you to open your Bibles there. We're looking this Christmas season at one of the prophetic texts of Scripture that was a, a foretelling of who Jesus was going to be as the Christ, who was it that God was promising Israel? Isaiah chapter 9. I'm going to read verses 6 and 7. For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders. And his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. There will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace on the throne of David and over his kingdom. To establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness, from then on and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. Lord, I do come to you right now and, and I confess that everything in me is not enough to communicate how amazing this text of Scripture is. I don't have words that are adequate to describe your character. And not just your character, but your game plan and the way that you are coming to save the world. And because I'm not adequate at communicating this, Lord, there's going to have to be a miracle that happens between my lips and their ears. And so I'm asking this morning that you would be the one that opens minds and hearts so that we can understand who you are. I ask in Jesus' name, amen. If you'll forgive me for just a second, my, my podium has been turned. And that may not drive you all nuts, but I'm going to go bonkers. I don't have OCD usually. As a matter of fact, I'm the one that will make a picture crooked just to drive people nuts. But the grain of the wood needs to go up and down the aisle. Sorry. 
I was not going to be able, now all my stuff's sideways. I'm sorry, I, I, I could not do that. Now life is good. Isaiah 9. We've come to the part where, where he is God Almighty, the mighty God. And one of the, the things that I want to, 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 to bring out here is this is definitely a name of God, not just, uh, uh, well, let, let's just say there are other names in the Bible that have the word God in them. The word L. There, there's parts that where somebody will say either lover of God or fear of God or servant of God, and, and the word God is part of their name. However, this is not one of them. This is, this is definitely a name. This mighty God is definitely a name that is only set aside for one who is divine. And I want to show you this because it's going to kind of set the tone for the rest of where we're headed. It's in chapter 10, verse 21. I'm going to get a run and start in, in verse 20, and then we'll hit verse 21. But this is Isaiah 10, verses 20 and 21. Now in that day, the remnant of Israel and those of the house of Jacob who have escaped will never again rely on the one who struck them, but will real, uh, truly rely on the Lord, the Holy One of Israel. A remnant will return, the remnant of Jacob, to the mighty God. And this is the same term here that's used in Isaiah 9, 6. So we know that Isaiah 9, 6 is talking about the one who is to come is definitely going to be a divine name. As a matter of fact, one of the commentators said it this way, there's a lot of people who may have God in their name, but God never goes by the name Moses or David or Abraham. God doesn't take on our earthly names. We sometimes put his name into ours, but he never takes the name Abraham, Moses, or so forth. So we know that Isaiah 9, 6 is talking about someone who is coming, who is the divine, mighty God. Now, this is kind of where, where I thought, man, I, I'm going to love this sermon because as many of you know, I do have a passion for our military, things that show strength. I like to to shoot guns, and I love to see stuff blow up. And I'm thinking, this is going to be a fun sermon because here's the Almighty God. And, and, and I want us to look at what the word mighty meant throughout the Old Testament. So here's what we're going to do. I've got a couple of readers that I've given cards to. We're going to play a little bit of, of Bible uh, reading. And so, if you will, uh, I, I want us to, to hear real loud, who, who did I assign Joshua 1.14 to? If you'll stand real loud, Joshua 1.14. That particular text said fighting men, right? Okay, this is Joshua whenever he's about to come into the promised land and he's got all of these tribes that he's bringing in to take part of the land. And right now they're on the east side of the Jordan River and there's a couple of tribes that are going to stay over here. And then he says the rest of them are going to be on the west side of the Jordan River. And he tells this group over here, don't you even think about settling into your home until you help these over here come in. And so this is the part where he says, I need you to gather up all your valiant men, those men who... who who are mighty for battle. Okay, uh, the, the next one is Joshua 8.3. Who's got it?
<laughs> 30,000 of these guys, that, that they are mighty, and at night, no less. Those weren't guys who are afraid of the dark. These guys were studs of the studs, and he said, I want you to head out at night. I want you to take care of business. All right, who's got Joshua 10, 7? Who, who, all right, Paul. Guys, you, you don't understand until you have until you have lived and walked in this nasty, horrible terrain that they were coming up through as they were on this exodus. It, it's tough enough to be a sissy over there. I can't imagine how hard it is to be a valiant warrior. I mean, we we were crying out for water after just a morning. And we had backpacks with little water bladders on. We weren't fighting. We were taking notes. And these guys, no, these are real valiant warriors. And it's the same word that's used here for mighty God describing the promised child to come. Okay? So, so that kind of gives us a little bit of a picture. Okay, who, who's got Judges 6 verse 12? Who did I give that one to? Now, this is spoken to Gideon. Now, I don't know if you know about Gideon. Guys, listen up here. I want you to know that crying babies are cool. Because guess what? God made them. And guess what else? We're a family in here. And this church would be dead if it wasn't for kids. But I want you all to listen to me, okay? This is Gideon who is probably my favorite Old Testament character. Because Gideon is the one that I most understand, I most relate to, because Gideon was a nobody in a family of nobodies. And as a matter of fact, when God finds him at this particular part in the story, he is hiding do, up in caves doing work that you only do out in the plains where the wind can blow. And the reason he's in a cave is because he is a scaredy cat. So not only is he a weak one, his family is weak, his clan is weak, and here he is all scaredy tailed up in a cave because he doesn't want the Midianites to find him. And God addresses him saying, Oh, valiant warrior. And I'm sure Gideon's thinking, You've got the wrong guy. He's out there. And God says, No. And as the story unfolds, we find out why God called him a valiant warrior. It's because God was going to move to a point in Gideon's life where Gideon would lead an army that was only 300 strong, that defeated an entire Midianite army, and he did it with the worst battle plan you could possibly find, trumpets and, and clay jars. That's horrible weaponry. You served in the military. Would you ever consider loading up with musical instruments and lanterns and say, let's go get them. That's why God said, oh, valiant warrior, you're about to do something that's going to blow every military chart out of the water. I'm going to give you a strategy that only I can pull off, and I'm giving you a name that only I can fulfill in you, Gideon, oh, valiant warrior. And that word valiant warrior it is, valiant is what we see in Isaiah 9, 6 when it says, He is mighty. All right, so the next one is 1 Samuel 16, 18. Who's got it? Just real quick, what is the context of, of that that we just heard? What's going on around there? 
of what's about to happen. Do, do, do you know? Is that, is that where they're looking for somebody to defeat Goliath? Nolan, how old are you? Nolan, this Nolan, how old are you? Ten, come here. Mark, go back to that text of Scripture again. <laughs> Stand right up here by me, okay? This is somewhat probably the neighborhood of how old David was whenever this was written about him. Go ahead and read that text again. Can you sing, Nolan? No. <laughs> well, you're at least handsome, right? <laughs> are, are you a valiant warrior? No. no. Guys, can you imagine having stumbled upon Nolan somewhere, watched him fight, possibly a bear and a lion and win. And somebody's looking for somebody that can defeat some giant that's over nine foot tall and he's bad mouth and you're God. Somebody says, you know what? I know just the guy for the job. The valiant warrior. Thanks, Nolan. So, so it's kind of taking a little bit of a turn here. It, it's kind of weird. So apparently it must not always mean somebody that's huge and strong. Maybe, maybe there's more to this valiant thing than just size. But let's go to the next text of, of 2 Samuel 23, 8. Who's got it? No, I had given I'd given Second Samuel twenty three eight to somebody. Was that okay? It should be Second Samuel twenty three verse eight, and just read the first kind of line ish of it. Okay, that's enough. If I love the story of Gideon, then there's a, at least a chapter that, that I love to read, and it's Second Samuel 23, because it goes through the mighty men of David. The word mighty here is the same word used to describe in Isaiah 9, 6, the one who is to come. Now, when you read through... 2 Samuel 23, and you read about the, the mighty men of David. I mean, these are guys, one of them is in battle so long, his hand is stuck to the sword. He's not letting go of the sword, and, and he's going to fight until death. You've got another one that doesn't even make it into the top three who killed a lion in a pit on a snowy day. I mean, these are some serious warriors. These are the kind of guys that... that that you don't make fun of no matter how ugly they are because they can absolutely dismember you. And, and he calls them his sturdy, mighty men. These are men that would run across enemy lines to get David a drink of water at his Bethlehem well and then come back. That's the kind of might that these men had. And so as I'm, as I'm trying to study this Isaiah 9, 6 passage and I'm looking at all of these, these pictures through the Old Testament of what they would have thought was in this squishy present of, of a Messiah, I, I couldn't help but to think of it like this. Isaiah 9, 6. Anybody remember about what year it was? I told you about what year, how, how long before Christ? About 700-ish years before Christ. So they're thinking, 
God's going to give us a Messiah one day who's going to fit. We'll start back with the Joshua text, and there's actually some uses of it before Joshua. He's going to give us a Messiah that looks like those guys who, who came across the river and fought for the homeland because God had given the homeland and, and, and we needed some guys who could fight off enemy nations so that our people could claim what is rightly theirs. So it must look like that. And, and so that was one clue. And then you come to the, that next text that we were looking at uh, of Judges and Gideon, and, and we hear again this name that, that, that Gideon is a, a mighty warrior. And so that gives us a little clue. Maybe this is going to be somebody who comes in, and even though he doesn't have a big army, maybe, looking back, maybe, maybe like 12 guys. Maybe God gives him a small army. But he's going to defeat this, this enemy that, that's absolutely wrecked our lives. So maybe that's, or, or maybe, maybe, just maybe, God's going to give us somebody like David who, who he wasn't all that big or old but he could defeat bears and lions and giants. And keep in mind, when these people are listening to this text, they are listening to the Assyrians breathe down their neck. They're needing a deliverer. So maybe this Messiah is going to be like David, who was about 300 years before Isaiah, about 1,000 years before Christ. Maybe, maybe that's what he's going to look like, or maybe not. Maybe, maybe just maybe he really is going to be like the 30 mighty men. Small group of men, surely that's got to be what he looks like, right? Surely, if God's going to give a promised Messiah... He's going to look like the mighty men. Somebody turn to Luke 2. Read verse 7. Somebody stand and read it. Finally, finally this Messiah comes. And surely he's either going to be like Joshua's guys or Gideon or David or David's men. And you want to know why most of the world missed him? It's because he looked like this. God threw a curve. Oh, it was there all the time, but his might looked different than what they thought. You see, what they were expecting was something like this. An agent of death who could come in and get rid of things or perhaps it would be someone who would look like this, who would bring financial stability to God's people and give them everything they ever wanted. And, and, and maybe, just maybe, that was it. Or maybe he was going to have the right position and title. You know, the, the kind of position that we think he should have. And this was their idea of Messiah. And he said, no, 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 no. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come and I'm going to do something different. This is what might looks like. And it blew their mind. 
Again, that's why so many people missed him. And, and if you think that our own society has, has caught this, they haven't. Just so that you know, this is kind of a little uh, rabbit trail here. Those of you who are Marvel fans, did you know that Marvel in their comics, their actual comics, not their show, and so, in their actual comics, they actually have uh, a, a line of uh, Giborum, and the, the word might here, El Gabor, uh, Gabor means might. They at Marvel has used the Gaborum as some of their characters that are mighty heroes. Marvel has chosen to use the Hebrew word for might for some of their characters who are superheroes. The world is still looking for a superhero. God said, that's not it. I want to read just an excerpt from, from this book. This is Seal of God. I told you, I just love military stuff. This is, this is a Navy SEAL who gave his life to Christ once he became a SEAL. And because of his following Jesus Christ, was harassed so much that he ended up leaving the SEALs. I want to read just a portion of his story because I want you to see the shift uh, I- I- at least in, in what the world says is mighty, because I think you would agree that we think Navy SEALs are mighty. J- just listen to a story. All right, Scott, we-, we made it, I thought, when the Navy SEAL trident was pinned onto the left chest of my uniform for the first time. All the work, all the physical and mental perseverance, the shivering in the Pacific Ocean and sweating on the grinder, the scrambling to find my way in Laguna uh, Laguna Mountains in Alaska, it all led to the moment when I received the insignia that let everyone who saw it know that I was officially a SEAL. I had done what I said I would do. I had accomplished my big thing. My limit of 20 family members and friends drove down for the graduation ceremony to share with me one of the most happy days of my life. Then we all headed up to Huntington Beach where my parents had planned a big graduation party for me at home. I drove alone in my truck with plenty of time to reflect on what had just taken place. The trip home became one of the saddest times of my life. The further I drove and the deeper I reflected, the more let down I felt. I had reached my mountaintop only to discover after a brief look around that the view disappointed me. And there was no higher step to take. I had reached as high as I could reach, accomplished everything I believed I could accomplish. I just graduated two hours ago, and this is how I feel? My entire focus had been on making it through the rigors Uh, of becoming a SEAL. And now that I had done that, what else was there? I still wanted to be a SEAL. I still wanted to serve my country overseas. I still carried my motivation from Scott's death. But even with all that, I just couldn't see how anything about being a SEAL could make me any higher than what I had achieved to become a SEAL. There had to be more, (coughs) excuse me, than a hundred people at my parents' house for the celebration. Everywhere I turned, someone was walking up to me with a, Congratulations, Chad. Thanks, I would answer with a smile, a fake smile. I knew they expected me to appear excited, but deep down I wasn't. Why did I feel so disappointed? I was confused. It didn't make sense to feel this way, but I did. This was what I had been building toward, and now that I was here, something was missing. I just couldn't identify what it was. I didn't tell anybody how I felt. I just began looking around for the missing piece. He came to find out that that missing piece is Jesus Christ. You see, when God redefined what might is... It changed everything. Might no longer looked like this. According to 
according to following Jesus, it looked like this. I want to show you the New Testament proof for this because this is what Jesus is calling calling his followers to. New Testament word for might, kratos, K-R-A-T-O-S. Turn with me to Acts 19. Oh, man, did Christmas ever change everything? Acts 19, 20. I'm going to read to you text of Scripture that have the word might in them. I want to get a run and start into this particular text. Go to, to verse 17. This became known to all uh, both Jews and Greeks who lived in Ephesus and fear fell upon them all and the name of the Lord was being magnified. Many also of those who had believed kept coming, confessing and disclosing their practices. Many of those who practiced magic brought their books together and began burning them in the sight of everyone. And they counted up the price of them and found 50,000 pieces of silver. <coughs> Excuse me. So the word of the Lord was growing mightily and prevailing. Here's what happened when Jesus was born. The word might began to look like the word of the Lord growing in a place where people were giving their lives to Christ in midst of pagan worship. That's what might started to look like people's lives being changed. Go to Ephesians 6. Ephesians chapter 6. Verse 10. Finally, Be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. So what does might look like in Ephesians 6? It looks like being covered with truth and righteousness and peace and faith and salvation and prayer. That's what might looks like. It's no longer an army that's going out to defeat and kill and be agents of destruction. It's it's someone who armors up for battle, but this time their armor isn't steel plates or leather plates or whatever. It is somebody who is equipped with righteousness and salvation and prayer. Go to Colossians 1. Colossians chapter 1. Verses 11 and 12. Again, thanks to Paul and his run-on sentences, we're going to have to start up just a little bit to get an idea of what's going on. Verse 9, for this reason also, since the day we heard of it, we have not ceased to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding so that you will walk in a manner worthy of the Lord to please him in all respects, being fruit, uh, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Listen to this and strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for the attaining of this steadfastness and patience and joyously giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. So what does, what does 
might look like here. It's that which enables a believer to attain steadfast patience and joyously giving thanks because we share in his inheritance. Let me dumb that down for you a little bit. Might looks like being able to come in here and worship even when you don't know what your health is going to be or you have lost a loved one or you have lost a job or your family is in grief or the one that you wish was beside you isn't beside you and you still come in here and worship. That is might because he gives the strength to kneel down in front of him and still say, I worship you. That's what might is. 1 Timothy 6. And and I'm just, I'm going to share with you this one. There's so many others like it that I'm not going to read, but 1 Timothy 6, verse 16 We'll start at verse 13, but please key in at verse 16. Verse 13, I charge you in the presence of God who gives life to all things and of Christ Jesus who testified the good confession before Pontius Pilate that you keep in the commandment uh, uh, without strain or reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ which he will bring about at the proper time. He who is blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, who alone possesses immortality and dwells in the unapproachable light, whom no man has seen or can see to him be honor and eternal. This word dominion is the word might. He has eternal dominion. (coughs) In the New Testament, what does might look like? It looks like God having eternal dominion. I tell you this because Jesus didn't come to the earth just for show and tell. He didn't come here as some piece in a museum or some subject for us to study like it's a specimen. He came so that our lives could be changed. And here's what I want to leave us with this morning based on what we've seen in the text. What do we need to do in light of what we've just seen? The first thing is we need to clothe ourselves with what's in Ephesians, or sorry, let me start. We continue to take his word to the dark places and watch it grow. We need to take it to the dark places and watch it grow. That, that's in Acts 19. Just like what we saw in Ephesus whenever those riots were happening and, and Paul stood up and gave a defense, that's what we need to do. That's what might looks like. And so here's my question. Where are those dark parts of your world where somebody does not know his word? Maybe it's your street. Maybe it's your neighbor. Maybe it's a family member whom you love dearly, but they do not know Jesus Christ. If you want to show might, if you, if you want to put his might on display, it looks like taking his word to some dark place and, and, and saying, Lord, would you please cast light on your truth? And if you don't think that takes might, I dare you to go share Christ with somebody. Most of us shake at the thought, of sharing Jesus with someone. It takes true might to open our mouth and talk about Christ. Okay, then the next thing that we need to do is we need to clothe ourselves like what's in Ephesians chapter 6. I I told you that that might looks like being clothed with truth and righteousness and and your feet shod with the uh, readiness of the gospel of peace. It looks like you waking up in the mornings and saying, Lord, I know I'm about to go into battle. Would you please prepare me for this? 
It would be absolutely insane for our soldiers today to run around in a wartime setting absolutely stark naked. That would be ludicrous. I can't imagine it. I hope you're not imagining it, you sickos. How nuts would that be for our soldiers to run around naked? Do you realize, spiritually speaking, that's how many of us run around during the week if we have not clothed ourselves in the armor of God? We have entered a battle that we are not prepared to win. If we want to appreciate Christmas to the fullest, then we will be clothed in His clothes. Another thing is we we come here together and we wake up in the mornings and in private we worship. Miss Peg, if it's okay, I'm I'm gonna, I'm gonna pick on you just a minute in love. Because I'll tell you what, my love and appreciation for her grew exponentially this week whenever we visited because I know through the years she has struggled with with heartache and brokenness and things that have come in her life. And to hear how many times she has woken up in the mornings and spent time with her master blew me away. She has a discipline to worship and to study that I dare say many in this room cannot hold a candle to her discipline. That's what it looks like to be mighty in faith. And Miss Peg, I want you to know that that based on, on, on what we shared in this text, you are one of the generals in this body. And I thank you for that example. Because that's what it looks like to get up and worship even when you don't feel like it. That's what might is. And then it means that we accept the invitation to be with him who will reign forever. Again, 1 Timothy 6 verse 16. Listen to this. Who alone possesses immortality and dwells in unapproachable light whom no man has seen or can see to him be honor and eternal dominion. Here's one thing that I want to leave with you guys is there's absolutely no way to be mighty and there's no way to be appreciative of what Christ has done at Christmas if we're not going to be with him in his dominion in his kingdom forever and ever and ever. Apart from Christ, there is no hope. And the only way you can possibly appreciate Christmas in the fullest way is to have given your life to Jesus Christ who came not just to bring destruction and death as what many see in the Old Testament, but he is the author and the perfecter of life, the one who came to seek and to save the lost. And maybe, just maybe, you're one of those in here this morning who has come in here, and like Ryan said, you've been in a a thousand worship services, but you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior. Today needs to be the day of your salvation I'm going to take in just a few minutes we're going to sing and if God's doing something in you it is time to let go you can come talk to me or one of our leaders they'll be down here but I'm going to encourage you come talk to somebody because we want to introduce you personally to Jesus Christ And for those of us who already do know him, it's high time to show his might by grabbing somebody's hand who doesn't know him and say, let's go meet Jesus. Oh Lord, I thank you so, so much. 
Not that you change the game plan from the Old Testament to the New Testament, but that you gave us clear understanding that, that might is more than just land and promises. It is about people and drawing folks into a relationship with you. Thank you that you've given us Jesus Christ, the mighty God. It is my prayer today that you would draw people to yourself, that, that we would begin to follow you the way you want to be followed, that we would bring others with us. Oh God, this news is way too good for us to keep to ourselves. I love you. And I pray these things in Jesus' name.